like I said just a few moments ago, very nice that you would come um, uh, on this Friday evening out of the sunshine into the Omni Theater uh, for a very special visit from a very special scholar, uh, Professor Paul Robert Magochi. I'm really pleased he's here. Um, this is what uh, Oz mentioned to the editorial board of Sesfit in 1991. So I'm quoting him here. My mother was born and raised in Rivne, a Ukrainian town she bought, uh, excuse me, she brought with her to Jerusalem. She sang lullabies to me in Ukrainian. She told me Ukrainian fairy tales and folk legends in Hebrew. Did she love Ukraine? Not quite. Did she hate it? No. As a child, I felt that her love for Ukraine was bound up with anger, and that this anger was bound up with grief, and that this grief was bound up with pain. And when I grew older, I understood this mixture of emotions has a name, unrequited love. For long stretches in our history, uh, we drew inspiration from each other. This relation often came at a cost, and it sometimes led to something more terrible. But I believe this, in Jerusalem there will always be a piece of Ukraine, and in Ukraine there will always be a piece of Jerusalem. Um, now, with that, I'd like to just uh, uh, offer the floor to our colleagues from the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter to explain more about mm -hmm. uh, what UJE does. Hi, I will speak from here. Um, my name is Detaya Fedrushek, and I am Director of Communications for uh, Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Yes, I know it's, it's lovely outside. Um, we, um, UJE is a privately funded uh, organization. We are a nonprofit, and it's now in its 10th year of existence. And in those 10 years, we've actually done quite a lot for a, a small organization. Um, we uh, recently were involved in the 75-year uh, anniversary commemorating Babinyar. Um, Professor Maguchi uh, was director of that program. Um, we participated in book fairs. Uh, we have had what is called the Shared Historical Narrative, where we brought in scholars from around the world to speak about the Ukrainian Jewish experience and to come up as it says a shared historical narrative. Uh, one of uh, a recent community exhibition that we had that traveled throughout <coughs> Canada is now going to be the basis of a larger exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum, which is going to take in about two years' time. One of the projects that we had uh, that has been really uh, a hallmark for us is the book Jews and Ukrainians, A Millennium of Coexistence. Professor Margucci, um has been traveling uh, around Ukraine and North America presenting this book and talking about the Ukrainian Jewish experience. We've now sort of, I guess, spread our wings and we're now beginning to travel throughout European cities. It is really um, a great honor for us to be here at Cambridge um, and you know to, to have this event in participation with the Ukrainian Studies program here because certainly from what all we have heard, this is a very important institute um, and an important venue for Ukraine and Ukrainian studies. And so with that, I just wanted to tell Rory, thank you very much for the quote by Amos Oz, because one of the projects that we have, have been working on is a translation of three works by Achron Appenfeld, who uh, died earlier this year, and um, Amos Oz, A Tale of Love and Darkness. Mm. So in any case, Professor Margucci, I give you the floor. Excellent. Excellent. May I just say a few words of introduction? Um, I might get sappy and personal, but um, uh, our speaker this evening, a uh, hugely accomplished, um, influential, leading uh, historian of East Central Europe and Ukraine, is Professor Paul Robert Magwichi, whose work has been hugely instrumental uh, for me and so many of our colleagues. Um, he is Professor of History and Political Science uh, and also Chair of Ukrainian Studies, holding the John Yaremko Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, to cite his publications would take me probably the hour or so that we have. Um, a wide variety of publications on sociolinguistics, immigration studies, history. Um, he um, has written such monographs as The Shape of National Identity, The People from Nowhere, and by my lights, the magisterial uh, um, uh, history of Ukraine, the land and its peoples, um, to which our students uh, very, very frequently and regularly refer. 
Um, it is wonderful to have him here, um, particularly to talk about um, the book project that uh, Natalia just mentioned. It's being co it was co-authored with um, our friend and colleague Johannan Petrovsky Stern, uh, Jews and Ukrainians: A Millennium of Coexistence. So, would you please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Robert Mamlachi? Uh, thank you, my dear colleague. This uh, kind of discussion today uh, is uh, in some ways a uh, hybrid. It is a part of a series of presentations that we are doing both in North America, in Israel, Western Europe, East Central, East Central Europe, Ukraine, um, primarily around a, a book which was just alluded to and which you now have copies passed around called Jews and Ukrainians. Uh, so many of the presentations are usually uh, designed around uh, specifically the book alone. Uh, Sometimes there are panelists who have had the book, read it, and make comments on it to provoke discussion, to encourage discussion on the part of the audience, most of whom hadn't yet seen the book or read the book. Uh, what I mean by kind of a hybrid here is, is that uh, I will not just follow that simple format <laughs> of telling you or saying a few words about the book per se, uh, but rather give a short uh, kind of lecture that addresses some conceptual issues that are not only related to this particular book, uh, but also to the whole question of how one deals uh, with uh, a multicultural society uh, multinational society as Ukraine uh, is and has always been uh, and uh, how does one deal with uh, some of the many peoples not all of them that uh, live on that territory uh, another caveat is that this is a book in a sp specific genre we are in an academic setting. I'm sure virtually all of you are uh, academics at various stages of your career, uh, whether it is as an undergraduate student or a graduate student or a research fellow or a professor, all of whom in whatever discipline uh, you work, are, we're all trained to to uh, do academic style writing. Uh, this is not an, a book for exclusively for fellow academicians. And in fact, primarily, it is for the public at large. So the very format uh, raises the whole question of how one moves outside the realm of the specific uh, university and into the public to get a message that is not done in this purely simplistic way or looking down but nonetheless in a communicative form which raises a whole host of issues of potential simplification etc stylistic questions uh, but before I mention a few words about that and I, I sort of alert you to this because this is a potential uh, a topic of, of, of interest to fellow uh, scholars uh, who uh, may in some time in their careers face that same need. But before doing that, I, as I said, I wanted to just share a few uh, ideas or remarks with you regarding uh, the conceptual challenges that we have faced in this Jewish-Ukrainian encounter uh, uh, and in and in a kind of relatively new field or subfield of 
the history of Jews, not simply in the generic larger Russian sphere, but more specifically uh, in the uh, sphere of Ukraine, and then to the degree to which one looks at or should look at the history and culture of any particular people as an end in itself, often in isolation, or rather as an integral part of the society in which they function. Uh, and from the very outset, this kind of project that we've been working on uh, has, as I said, raised several uh, conceptual issues. First, can one legitimately speak of Ukrainians and Jews? I mean, this is the title of, of this book. This is the title of the organization. Uh, as if they are distinct or self-perceived corporate entities, whether in the past or in the present. Put another way, do individuals that others define as Ukrainians or as Jews, do they actually feel themselves to be part of a group? Do they somehow act in their daily lives in a similar manner that reflects a so-called group or national uh, ethnic characteristics? And then what do we mean by Jews in Ukraine or Ukrainian Jews? Is there even such a phenomenon? And if there is, how does one define that phenomenon? And then who are Ukrainians? <laughs> By the way, <laughs> it was in the conversation I didn't mention, I just came back from a, from a two-day conference at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. last week, because there's a project now that's being funded for a, literally a history of Jews in Ukraine, which is not this book, but of course this book touches on this, so they, how is it different, so forth and so on. And this is chaired by Zvi Gettleman, some of you may know him, who is the person who's going to be the editor-in-chief of this thing. And he opens up this thing, this two-day conference, here we all are specialists, with the question, well, what is Ukraine? How do we define Ukraine? <laughs> And some of us are sitting there, especially me, which I get a little nervous about this. <laughs> we're coming down here. We're all specialists. We don't even know, allegedly, we don't even know what we're talking about. You've got to be kidding. And so uh, one of my interventions was just trying to set the, 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 uh, the guidelines of what this place is and what this is on. So after two days, we're finished. And so Zvi is summing up what we did for these two days, and he said, well, there's one thing that we achieved. Now we at least know what Ukraine is. It took two days. It took two days in 2000, good. 2018 to do this mm -hmm. as opposed to before. But it's, it's a reflection, actually, of some you know, serious um, uh, issues that have uh, faced that part of uh, uh, the uh, world. And so, as again, with the, not only what Ukraine is, what, what, who are Ukrainians? Are they, uh, are they people with, with uh, uh, definable uh, uh, Ukrainian ethno-linguistic characteristics? Uh, uh, or are they all people, all persons, regardless of their ethnic, ethno-linguistic origin, who are citizens of a state today called Ukraine? Could be either or. And for this discussion and what we have been doing, a few definitions we needed to be adopted. And uh, this might help us understand what we are calling uh, Jews and Ukrainians, Jewish-Ukrainian encounter. Namely that Ukrainian refers to a group whose members identify as belonging to the Ukrainian nationality sounds simple enough, but I would prefer to use not the term Ukrainian, but rather the term ethnic Ukrainian. Why? To distinguish people who are of cultural and linguistic characteristic Ukrainian from citizens of Ukraine, who technically include the country's entire population. 
it doesn't make a difference what their ethno-linguistic ancestry is, whether it is ethnic Ukrainian or Russian or Crimean Tatar or Polish or German or Moldovan or Jewish or whatever. <laughs> Now, that's for defining the term Ukrainian. The, the terms Jews in Ukraine or Ukrainian Jews at first glance seem to be somewhat easier to define, namely persons of Jewish religion or heritage who were born or live in Ukraine. But what about Jews of the historic past who lived at a time when Ukraine as a state did not exist? So how do we call these people? Or their descendants that have live in various parts of the world? Well, we've decided that for in this particular volume and in general, we do use a rather anachronistic approach, which is something that scholars do all the time and it's important that they at least realize it and, and alert the outside world and their readers to this. Uh, namely, persons of Jewish background, as we understand them, are designated as Ukrainian Jews or Jews from Ukraine if they have resided at some point in history on the territory of present-day Ukraine from the very earliest times to the present, regardless of whether a state called Ukraine existed when Jews in question that we're talking about lived there. Now this understanding does not necessarily coincide with how each of the groups in question have perceived themselves. Instead there exists what may be called a perceptual disconnect. A perceptual disconnect. On the one hand, ethnic Ukrainians consider their historic homeland to have always been Ukraine, territory that in the course of the 20th century finally became defined, first in Soviet times, there was an actual territory, and then eventually as an independent state. On the other hand, the Jews in question are part of a worldwide diaspora one branch of which are the Ashkenazim, who until recently had inhabited large parts of Central and Eastern Europe, including areas which from their perspective have only recently, quote unquote, become Ukraine. In those cases where some more specific territorial origin is called for, the general and often vague terms that one encounters to depict the places where Ukrainian Jews lived, Pale of Settlement, Russia, in more recent times, Soviet Union, or in the case of Hasidic adherents, no geographic place at all. Rather, they just belong to some rabbinic dynasty with which they and their families are associated, whether it's the Belz dynasty or the Bratslav, Chernobyl, Savran, Munkach, Ruzin, there's a whole host of them. That's their, that's their identity, that's their, that's their world. And on, on the other hand, also some Jews may identify with a specific region, such as Galicia, the Galiciana, or Bukovina, or Carpathian Rus, or Crimea, Krimchaks. The point is that for Jews, the concept of Ukraine is very rarely mentioned as an identifier to describe the origin of oneself or of one's ancestors. Rather, Russian Jew, Polish Jew, Soviet Jew, Galiciana, Krimchak, or Belzer, or a Munkacha dynastic follower, those are the terms that are usually used. and not with perhaps very rare exception, not Ukrainian Jew. Now various regional and country names do nonetheless reflect real differences within what we are defining. In many ways the Jewish cultural mindset derives from 
geopolitical structures that date from the late 18th century to the outbreak of World War I. We still haven't gotten over that. I don't know about the British Library, but certainly the Library of Congress. If you go into the stacks, the Library of Congress uh, card catalog system and codes are all based on pre-World War I. So, you know, it's still Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire. So if you want to go look for something on, on Bohemia or on Slovenia uh, or Croatia, you have to go into the section of Austria-Hungary. I mean, it's the same codes to this day. Or if you want to you know, study Romania or uh, Bulgaria, you got to go to the code for the Ottoman Empire. So we haven't gotten over that. So in, in, in academic structures, so what do you expect from people? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, this period before World War I, of course, uh, began first with the petitions of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1772 to 1795. And after 1795, Poland and Lithuania, as we know, ceased to exist. And those lands which had, until that time, belonged to the former Commonwealth, were next to the Russian Empire, becoming part of what was known as the Pale of Settlement. And one of those maps does depict at least the Pale of Settlement on, on Ukrainian territory. That is this map 13 that you see. Uh, the green portion is the, the settlement of ex itself, and the blue shows contemporary Ukrainian boundaries, so you can make a comparison. Uh, and th that area, the Pale of Settlement, encompasses farther north, present-day Lithuania and Belarus, and then most of Ukraine and, and uh, Moldova. The Pale had the highest number of Ashkenazi Jews anywhere in the world. The f nearly four million J Jews living in the Pale, and that included also, aside from that, a estimated two million who emigrated from there to North America between 1897 and 1917, all described themselves as their descendants do to this day as Jews from Russia or Russian Jews. That pale, as you can see on your map in the case of you referred to Russian imperial provinces, Volhynia, Podolia, Kiev, Chernihiv, Poltava, Katerinoslav, even Tarida down in the south. Uh, and it was that area where Jews were permitted to reside because historic Muscovy didn't allow Jews to live in lands, in Mus true Muscovy, only those lands that were taken or annexed from the old Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and that became the Pale. And you couldn't go on, you couldn't go beyond the Pale, so to speak. <coughs> Even within the Pale, there were various restrictions on where Jews could reside. And beginning in the 1880s, they were actually temporarily banned from moving as first-time residents to rural villages. It was also within the Pale, and specifically in those Tsarist provinces located in Ukraine that I've just enumerated, and as you can see on your map, where the anti-Jewish pogroms of 1881 and 1882 took place. Now, despite the restrictions on movement and periodic violence, as in the pogroms that I've just alluded to in the 1880s, and then later, more important one in Kishinev, even though that is not in Ukraine, it's in nearby Moldova. Uh, despite that, within the pale, Jewish communities continued to flourish, and in fact, even increase in numerical size. Uh, it's particularly the case in the Crimean Peninsula, where beginning in the 1880s, the Ashkenazi from other parts of Ukraine and the Pale began to settle in large numbers alongside the uh, Turkic-speaking Krimchak Jews and Karaites. So now we had a new addition. We had not only Krimchak Jews, we had Ashkenazi Jews, who were entirely different from the local Crimean Jews. Now, in stark contrast to Jews living in uh, Russia's uh, Pale of settlement were those residents in present-day Ukraine who found themselves after the 1870s within the Habsburg-ruled Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
Somewhat similar to the Russia's Pale of Settlement, a very high percentage of Jews were among the inhabitants of the provinces of Galicia and uh, of Bukovina, and um, uh, one can see that in your map, for, map 15 on page 42, the yellow, well, the yellow is where Ukrainians live, but these are the provinces of Galicia and, and the Bukovina, which were in the kind of Austrian half of the Habsburg Empire, and then uh, Carpathian Rus in the Hungarian half. The Jews in that, those areas, that is, in Haps, on the Habsburg rule, were able to effectively take advantage of the reforms introduced by the Austrian Emperor Joseph II in the 1770s, 1780s, also Maria Theresa's mother. Those reforms very important because they provided legal equality for all citizens, regardless of their religion. And so emancipated Jews within the Habsburg Empire already in the 18th century, were able to take advantage of full freedom of movement, settlement, anywhere in the Habsburg Empire. That allowed many of them, among other things, to improve their economic status. The more enterprising of them flocked to universities, particularly to medical and legal professions, in which Jews excelled within pre-war, pre-World War I, Habsburg, Austria, Hungary. And when in the 1880s, the danger of pogroms in the southern part of the Russian Empire, and particularly Ukraine, which was basically adjacent to the Habsburg Empire, Ukraine and Moldova, Jews from Russia's Pale of Settlement sought permanent refuge by crossing the border and settling, at least initially, in Austrian-ruled Galicia and Bukovina. And then when the Russian and Austro-Hungarian Empire both ceased to exist in the wake of World War I, as we know, the Jews of present-day Ukraine now found themselves in four new states, the Soviet Union, Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. <coughs> Those, in, as we know, in the former Russian Empire, now part of bolshevik ruled Soviet Ukrainian Republic, the Soviet Union, Soviet policies actually had both a positive and a negative impact on Jewish lives. On the one hand, religious Jews and their institutions were suppressed, and also petty merchants and retail shop owners were put out of business. On the other hand, Soviet law lifted all legal restrictions against Jews as a group, with the result that hundreds of thousands were able to make quite successful careers in Soviet institutions, whether in government or universities, scholarly research institutes, or in the industrial management sector. West of the Soviet border, those Jews from former Austro-Hungarian lands, as I said, now after World War I in Poland, Galicia was the next to Poland, in Romania, Bukovina was the next to Bukovina, Czechoslovakia, Carpathian Rus, modern-day Transcarpathia was the next. And during subs- those interwar years of the 20th century, the pre-World War I tolerance that was so characteristic of the Habsburg Empire toward Jews and other peoples for that matter was now replaced by restrictions especially in higher educational institutions uh, directed against the Jews in Polish ruled Galicia uh, or in Romanian ruled Bukovina exceptionally was in democratic Czechoslovakia Transcarpathia, where the Jews were able to achieve economic, social, and educational advancement that was not even available in pre-World War I Habsburg, Hungary. So what conclusions can we draw from what I've just said? Also, what kind of ideas, suggestions may be made on the basis of what I've just said? Well, the first conclusion has to do with the very formulation of Ukrainian Jewry as a term, or Ukrainian Jews. If we are to use that concept as an analytical tool, 
then we must accept the fact of Ukraine's regional diversity and the impact of that diversity on the country's Jewish inhabitants. Clearly, the frequently negative experience of Jews in Russian ruled pale of settlement during the 19th century is not at all the same as the flourishing world of Galician and Bukovinian Jews under Habsburg rule in the neighboring Austro-Hungarian Empire. By the way, some of you may know or not know that Jews in the Hungarian portion of this empire uh, actually did so well as being integrated into society that they were Jewish nobles, Hungarian nobles, Jewish, and, and remained Jews. Whereas pogroms were characteristic occurrences in certain times in the 19th and 20th centuries in many parts of Ukraine, with, uh, as well as in Eastern and Central Europe in general, there was one territory in present-day Ukraine that is Transcarpathia, or historic Subcarpathian Rus, that never experienced pogroms, or even any other kind of violence, which some Jewish historians, as opposed to calling them pogroms, call them excesses. So the point is, is, there's regional differentiation here, and you cannot just talk about Ukraine as a whole, uh, and the Jewish or any other experience, so it's dependent on where in present-day Ukraine. Now, a somewhat related conclusion, and one might say a recommendation, is the need to move away from the simplistic notion that the historic past of Eastern European Jewry is little more than the story of unmitigated tragedy. Central Europe, Eastern Europe, a black hole from which Jews had to leave in order to survive. Is this a reflection of the historic record? Jewish American scholar Stephen Zippestein, Zippestein, I guess in English, best summed up this in, in an essay on Holocaust historiography, and I quote him because this is quite interesting. In the absence of historical work, in the wake of fierce, definitive, immigrant memories about what life back there was like. And then in the, in, in the aftermath of the Shoah, pervasive premonitions of horrors regarding Eastern Europe were conflated and granted a grim presence, pre prescience. Nazi horrors and Tsarist pogroms meshed in the often sparse, repetitive narratives that Jews tended to tell about this vast, complex region. The distance between life in Vilna, of course we know this incredibly rich intellectual world epitomized by interwar Yivo, so the distance between life in Vilna and death in Treblinka tended to narrow in such accounts as if these differences were in detail only and not substance. Let me an anecdote I remember. Uh, I have a neighbor, close neighbor, who is of their, their Jewish background, living in Canada. Much younger generation. The kind of young Canadians who went off to the kibbutz, went through the kibbutz stage in Israel, building Israel. You know, they're, I wouldn't say they're religious Jews, certainly not. Hasidim, uh, but they are Jews and very proud of being Jews and Israelis and so forth and so on. And one time, the, sometime in the early fall, I come out. I come out of the house. We say hello as usual and so forth and so on. So I said, you know, attractive young woman. I say to her, oh, look, she said, yeah, I like that hat that you're wearing. It look, it reminds me of uh, a cap that was worn in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Her reaction, if my grandfather knew this, he would turn in his grave. 
because the perception is is that all of all of Central and Eastern Europe is this black hole. It was all bad all the time. Which, if anyone has a smattering of knowledge of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, this was like paradise for the Jews. When during World War I, they were driven from Galicia, they fled from Galicia in 1914 because of the advance of the Tsarist Russian army across the border in September already, and they were afraid of the Cossacks coming. So hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands fled to Vienna, to the capital of other parts of Hungary, and then to Vienna. By the way, these were these same exact Galician Jews that some painter sitting on the streets of, of Vienna at that time, and then later detested because they're coming in, you know, Adolf was watching this. Emperor Franz Josef, what does he do? He houses them in the Winter Palace. And some of his advisors say, well, what are you doing putting these shoes? These are my people. Because he was the emperor of all peoples. They were all equally Habsburg subjects. And yet the image of people who don't know anything about the historical past, that it's all bad. Even the Austro-Hungarian experience. Now, to the degree that Ukraine is part of this East European world, the manner in which its very name is treated becomes symptomatic of what Zippesheim is saying, and therefore also a matter of concern. Stereotypes, of course, one of which I've just alluded to, very hard to overcome, especially when they are embedded in the cultural discourse that goes back centuries. In fact, the medieval designation in Jewish sources for all the Slavic lands in Central and Eastern Europe, and that includes all of Ukraine, was Knan, Canaan, with the implication that it was, quote, the land of slaves. Max Weinrich, the great linguist, sociolinguist, has reminded us, quote, that the history of Yiddish and the history of the Ashkenaz are identical, but nevertheless, not in all periods or in all places did even European Jews speak Yiddish. I was particularly struck by Benjamin Hashab's discussion in, in an excellent monograph called The Meaning of Yiddish, where he actually lists the various other languages used by Europe's Jews, from Italian to Russian to English, many others in between, Hrashav's list excludes, however, one otherwise very influential language, which was not only spoken by large numbers of Ashkenazim, but also was the one that had an important impact on the later development of Yiddish, by the way, which is discussed in this book. That unmentionable language that was not on Hrashav's list was Ukrainian. Since traditionally most Jews referred to it not by its name, as they did Polish or Dutch or Czech, but simply as Goyish. Didn't even grant it the status of a name. Even within the Jewish world itself, the unmentionable Ukrainian lands took on especially negative characteristics. Here I have in mind the Galiziana, and this is within the Jewish world term used to describe not only Jews of the historic province of Austrian Galicia, uh, but also, at least in terms of Yiddish dialects, was a term used Jews living farther east in parts of Ukraine. Point here is that in contrast to super ultimately superior German Jews, who were always on top of the heap, if you will, uh, and even the sophisticated Litvaks, even though they were Easterners, uh, the term Galiziana, to quote the Evo Encyclopedia, is a cultural identifier bearing for the most part negative connotations, and basically it means a troublemaker, a shrewd operator, a muddy grubber, a religious fanatic, a spineless compromiser, a speaker of popular vulgar Yiddish, someone ashamed of his or her origins, 
but who liked to pose as an Austrian. Now, nomenclature, as we know, has enormous symbolic as well as instrumental value. And the subject, therefore, of our inquiry, we have determined should be Ukrainian Jews or the Jews of Ukraine. Also, place names, whether towns or historic regions, should reflect the usage in the country where they are located today. People can get very sensitive about place names. I mean, if you talk to uh, you uh, speak to a Ukrainian and so, sp sp uh, uh, talk about Lvov, uh, or for that matter, speak to a German and talk about Wroclaw. From their perspective, it's cultural appropriation. 